the suffering servant. And uh, I may lose my voice, so, it, so if I start to talk softly, I'm, I'm a little under the weather. Feel free in the back, Nathan. I'm just gonna trust that to you, brother. I know you will not feel uh, bad about interrupting me. So just let me know if I uh, am not projecting well. I'll try to push through. Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. prophet writes, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which is to- has been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful for Christ. Father, we are rebels. We're sinners. We're transgressors. We have willfully disobeyed your commands. And yet, in your grace and in your mercy, you have given us your Son. Thank you. And Father, as we uh, consider this text this morning, I pray, God, that you would grant us all wisdom. I pray that you, um, Father, would grant clarity of speech, clarity of thought. 
pray that you would encourage people. I pray that you would build our church. And I pray that you would conform us to the image of your Son. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we come this morning to what many Bible scholars would call the, the zenith of the Old Testament. It's been called uh, by Professor Southern the, the Mount Everest of Old Testament prophecy. Spurgeon referred to this text as a Bible in miniature, the gospel in its essence. Uh, Franz, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Delich, said it is the most central, the deepest, and the loftiest thing that the Old Testament prophecy, outstripping itself, has ever achieved. It looks as if it had been written beneath the cross upon Golgotha. Perhaps nowhere else in Old Testament prophecy do we see a more clear picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, just a little background on this prophecy. It's the fourth uh, of the great servant songs in Isaiah. Uh, the others are 42, uh, 1 through 7, 49, 1 through 6, and, and uh, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. And, and this song in particular is divided into five stanzas uh, with three verses per stanza, which makes uh, doing a, a preaching outline uh, a little easier. Uh, but the question we, we have to to really deeply consider is, is who is uh, this suffering servant? There's, there's three main ways it's interpreted. Um, the first, I'm going to write these over here, um, is that it's interpreted corporately. Um, forgive my, my writing. Um, it's interpreted corporately. Um, some scholars would say that the servant is uh, Israel, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. Uh, the difficulty uh, with, with that understanding, with understanding it corporately, the suffering servant, is, uh, is that Israel could not atone for their own sins. Much less the sins of the nations. Um, the second way is, is individually. Some scholars would say um, that uh, it's uh, Isaiah himself. Or uh, Hezekiah. Uh, some would even say Moses. And again, the difficulty with that is, is that these men themselves can also not atone for the sins of Israel or of the nations. Nor could they be ascribed with the, the degree of perfect innocence um, that we see that the, the servant has. And then thirdly, and, and my approach to the text is, um, let me interpret it messianic. Um, the suffering servant is the Son of God, the coming Messiah, the Davidic King, perfect and sinless obedience uh, to the Lord's will and plan. Um, this text is, is, is quoted uh, directly uh, seven times in the New Testament. There's over 40 allusions uh, to the text. Jesus himself, Paul, Peter, Matthew, Luke, and John are all in agreement as to who the servant is. Uh, perhaps the clearest example, and I invite you to turn there with me, is, is in Acts 8. You're familiar with the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 8, <clears throat> verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? 
and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does this prophet, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news. I think the suffering servant is Christ. So, um, looking, uh, let's, let's jump into the text. We're gonna we're gonna walk through this again uh, according to the five uh, standards. And the first thing that we're told, we're told to behold the servant's success. We're told to behold the servant's success is exaltation. We see that in verses uh, 13 through 15. And before I read these, I want to say these verses are a summation of, of the entire prophecy. It's, it's, it's summing up. Uh, it's, it's, it, and it's really, what's interesting is it, it's kind of the end of the story, um, these, these verses. Um, but here it is, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has been told them, uh, which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. So he's he's exalted because of his, of his success. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and exalted. Notice first here that the servant belongs to the Lord. The Lord is saying, this is my servant. Behold, my servant. The Lord is pleased with the prudence of the servant. The servant has acted in such wisdom that he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Now that, that threefold exaltation, high, lifted up, and greatly exalted, that's used only three other times in the entire Bible, all of which are in Isaiah we find it in uh, Isaiah 6.1, Isaiah 33.10, Isaiah 57.15. In each of those other occurrences, it's always used in reference to the Lord. It's always used in reference to deity. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is the servant is God. But we'll, we'll see that uh, more as we go. Second, we see he's exalted because of his suffering. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. The, the servant's body was so mangled that he did not appear to be human. People were astonished. They would be paralyzed at the horror of his suffering and the extent of the cruelty that was inflicted upon him. And we also see that he's exalted because of his service. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. This reference to the sprinkling of uh, many nations carries the idea of, of, of making the nation ceremonial clean. Ceremonially clean. It describes to the servant a, a priestly role on behalf of the nations. They work so magnificent it would leave kings speechless. So they're silent. They're dumbfounded before the servant. Perhaps because he was so rejected, so low, he suffered so horrifically. How could he do something that would impact the world? Now, we don't currently live under the rule of a, of a monarch. Um, but 
you know, I think through history books and, and through it portrayed on uh, TV and movies and such, we, we kind of have an idea of what that would look like um, and what it would look like to be in the king's presence. No one walks into the king's presence and demands that he shuts his, his mouth. Uh, in fact, if you walk into the king's presence, you're probably not allowed to speak unless he gives you permission to speak. But the servant does something so wonderful that speaks to his authority in such a way that kings shut their mouths on a king. That the kings of the earth shut their mouths before this servant. Here we, let's move on to the, uh, the second stanza, verses 1 through 3 of chapter 53. We see, or behold, the servant's rejection. Behold the servant's rejection. Verse 1, chapter 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him, the Lord, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. The question I want us to consider here is, is what or whom is the arm of the Lord? Implied in the the province uh, question when he says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? What he's implying there is, is that the arm of the Lord has not yet been revealed. Now we've seen uh, the acts of, of the arm of the Lord. We've seen the product of the arm of the Lord, and, and he even, uh, we, we see that in, in Deuteronomy 7, uh, where, and it's speaking of, of Israel's deliverance out of, out of Egypt. Um, but what the prophet here is implying is that the arm of the Lord has not yet been revealed, it has been concealed. And we find in verse 2 just what the prophet means by it. He says, Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And to him, for he, notice the arm of the Lord is personified. He grew up before him, that being God, like a young plant. The arm of the Lord grew up before God the Father. It means clearly the, the incarnation of Christ, God becoming man, God the Son becoming man, growing up before God the Father and before men in wisdom and stature. Uh, These verses also echo um, what was said of of Jesus in the New Testament, where um, Jesus is in Nazareth, and and they say, Who is this speaking with such wisdom and authority? And they say, Is this not the carpenter's son? They say things like, What good could come out of Nazareth? Who is this? And they despised him. Rejected him. They were astonished at his wisdom, but yet they rejected him. This suffering servant arose out of humble circumstances. A poor nation. A nation that's, that's not even governing itself, it's governed by another. A poor family. A son of a carpenter. And out of Nazareth. As if you couldn't get any lower. And they looked on him and they said, there is no way he can make a difference. So we despised him. We considered him worthless. He appeared weak. And what can a weak man do for any less? He can't deliver. He was despised and rejected. We esteemed, we accounted that he would not add up to anything in life. And third stanza, so we behold the servant's passion. Verse 
We behold the servant's passion. In verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bore our sorrows. The, the word stricken, it was sometimes used uh, in reference to leprosy. Often they believed that the, the Lord would, would, would um, bring leprosy because of a, a person's sin. Um, if, if someone was suffering, if they were afflicted in life, it was because uh, God was judging them. And so when, when, when they esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, they're saying, you are a wretch. There, there is something really wrong with you because God is judging you. Well, we know what was wrong with him was what was wrong with us. He was bearing our sin. He bore our suffering. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace. And with the stripes we are healed. The suffering servant was wounded or pierced through for our transgressions. Uh, a transgression is, is, is just a, uh, that's a willful rebellion against God. It's, it's saying, God, I know that this is sin. I know that you hate this. I know that this is bad for me. And I'm going to do it anyways. That's a, that's a transgression. It's not even accidental sin or sin that we fall into just in a moment that is willful, intentional rebellion. The servant was punished that we might know peace. By his stripes, his welts, his wounds, we are healed. When the prophet says that we are healed, he means us in a total sense. I'm not just talking about a physical healing, a, a physical uh, wound healing, but the healing of a whole person, restoring to fullness and completeness. Such a healing is a mark of the Messianic day. Isaiah 30, 26 speaks of such a day when the Lord binds up the brokenness of His people and heals their wounds. He bore our sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of of us all. This echoes, this first echoes of, of Romans 3.23, doesn't it? For all sin and fall short of the glory of God. It, it also echoes uh, early in Romans 3 where Paul quotes the psalmist saying, none are righteous, no, not even one. All of us have strayed from God who created us. I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. All have wandered and all have sinned but one. The servant is innocent. Yet the Lord, God the Father, has laid on the innocent servant our guilt. What we have here is, is penal substitution. God placing our sin on the innocent servant as a substitute so that he can bear our sin and the wrath of the Father because we cannot. Christ did not live to strictly be a moral influence, a good teacher. He did not die just to show us how much He loves us. He died in our place as our substitute, a sin bearer and a wrath bearer. He bore our sin, our wrath, and in return we are given His righteousness. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is what Christ has done for us. Behold, 
the sin-bearing, suffering, and sorrowful servant. Fourth stanza, behold the servant's submission. Behold the servant's submission. And we find this in verses 7 through 9. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Um, I really wrestled with it. Share, y'all, share this with y'all. Uh, I don't mean to be grotesque. But uh, I grew up on a small farm. We had cows. We had goats, we had pigs, uh, dogs, chickens, all those things. Um, it was not a, a part of everyday farm life, but it did happen occasionally where um, whether an, an animal had been fatally uh, wounded or whether it was just time to eat it, um, you had to put an animal down. And uh, never once when I would go to do that, did the animal know what was going on? Uh, he, he wasn't alarmed. Uh, if he was running away from me, it was not because he feared uh, for his life. Um, typically, pretty, pretty trusting. The suffering servant was led to slaughter knowing what a way to do. And he still works. Servant knows the injustice that is being done. Though he is innocent, he's being led to slaughter, and yet he remains silent. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't protest his treatment. He knows exactly what is coming, and he does not try to evade it. He was submissive in his death. By oppression and judgment, verse 8, he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Um, the mention of judgment or oppression here may be indicative of, a, of an unfair trial. And when the prophet says that he was taken away, it means he was taken away to be slaughtered. I, I never... Uh, typically slaughtered the animal near the barn. Uh, it was taken away to be slaughtered. A lamb led to slaughter. The servant of the Lord was executed with no offspring left behind. To die without offspring, um, ancient Israelites thought that person was accursed by God. He was. The servant was cursed. He bore our curse. The righteous servant of the Lord we see here is buried with the wicked. It should not have ended this way. He had done no violence. And there was no deceit found in his mouth. And that's basically saying there's, there's no deceit found in his, his person. No sin. Completely innocent. This righteous one lived like a servant. He suffered like one accursed. He died like a criminal. Yet he was buried like a prince. He was given... Uh, the grave of a rich man. It's interesting, perhaps foreshadowing of what's to come. All right, the fifth stanza. Behold the servant's salvation. Can y'all even read that? <clears throat> Behold the servant's salvation. Verse 10. 
Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When a soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. This was all according to the counsel of God's will. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. He died in accordance with Scripture. We've seen that in 1 Corinthians 15, which Lee's been working through the last couple weeks. It says he died in accordance with Scriptures. He was buried and raised in accordance with Scriptures. These are the Scriptures that he, he died and was raised in accordance with. The life of the servant was not taken from him. It was not forced from him. He willingly gave it away so that he may take it back up again. This was all in accordance with the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now, it's, it's Easter. Happy Easter. Um, today, we, we celebrate not only a crucified Lord, but we also celebrate a resurrected Lord. And, and so you may be wondering, well, you know, it's Easter. Where's the resurrection sermon, right? Where's... He's not at least going to address the resurrection for Easter. Well, it's here. Um, it's here. And it's a good thing it's here because we often think of this text as, as the gospel in the Old Testament. We, we don't have a gospel without the resurrection. There is no gospel. Uh, if there's no resurrection, we of all people are most to be pitied. If there's no resurrection, our, we are still in our sins. Well, it's here uh, in this verse. And, um, we see that the servant's suffering and his death was not the end. While this text may not scream Christ's resurrection as loudly as it does his crucifixion, I think we still have a fairly clear picture that death was not the end for the serpent. Consider the, the second half of verse 10. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. A dead man cannot see anything. So if the servant has been placed in a rich man's grave, how is it that he now sees? How is it now that he has offspring when he died without offspring and was accursed? Well, it's because the servant was raised from the dead. He died, but he now lives. Yes, he was crushed by God, but he is also blessed by God and was raised by God the Father according to His definite plan of foreknowledge. This salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of the servant was purposed by the Lord. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my, lost my place. Um, That don't take this on authority. Um, this this may be a, a pretty pretty big leap. Um, some of your translations may say that the servant shall see light after the anguish of his soul. Um, what if that's what if that's a reference to Christ's resurrection and, and rolling back to the tomb? I mean, in the tomb he's cloaked in darkness, and when the tomb is rolled back. Surely he saw light. Um, whether that's the case or not, whether that's a huge leap or not, this still is, is a reference to the resurrection of the servant. He experienced great anguish on the cross. He died. He was placed in a tomb. He was raised from the dead. But 
he shall see the work of his hands and be satisfied in it. And I think it's a, that's a model for us to follow. If I can get practical for a moment. Um, are you satisfied? Typically, uh, knowing myself and perhaps projecting myself on you, um, I can be pretty, pretty discontent guy. I can always be looking for that next circumstance. Um, and I think if only I had that, life would be better. And then perhaps I arrive at that circumstance and I'm thinking, well, if only I had that, life would be better. What if we did as the servant does here and we look constantly upon his accomplished atonement and we see it and we're satisfied in it? What if our greatest source of satisfaction comes from the gospel rather than this thing that we don't have because we have this. This is ours. Let's fix in our eyes upon the gospel and find true satisfaction in Christ. So He, the righteous one, has made many to be accounted righteous. He does so by giving us His righteousness and taking our sin. And because He has done this, the Father has given Him a portion, an inheritance, a, a spoil. The, the picture here is a, of, a, a, of a victory parade, a, a king marching back into the city Victorious, a victorious conqueror, carrying the spoils of war. We, the church, are the spoils of war. We have been ransomed from the power of sin and death. So behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who bore our griefs, who carried our sorrows, who was wounded for our transgressions, and who was bruised for our iniquities. Behold the Lamb of God, who was oppressed and afflicted, and who was slaughtered. Behold this Lamb of God, who was cut off, stricken for our transgressions, the one who was crushed by the Lord, and the one whom the Lord put to grief. Behold the Lamb of God, whose soul made a sin offering, who was poured out to death and numbered with the transgressors and bore the sin of many and has made intercession for the transgressors. Behold, the Lord's servant has acted wisely. And praise God. And as I conclude, we're, we're really only given kind of one command, one imperative in this text. And that's to behold the servant. That's, that's our application. Uh, but here's, here's some additional thoughts. Know that the Lord is sovereign over your suffering. It was the Lord who put the servant to grief. It was the Lord who crushed him. It was the Lord who laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord meant it for His good and for our good as well. It has absolutely resulted in His good and our good, which means we can trust the Lord with our suffering. He is sovereign over what may be happening to us. And if you love Him and if you trust Him, He intends your good. So whether you're suffering now or at some point in the future, be comforted that the Lord is sovereign over your suffering and is for your good. Secondly, and lastly, just be reminded of what Christ has done for you. No one's ever been more rejected. No one has ever felt more alone. We, we see in this text that He was rejected by men on one side and on the other side. He was crushed by God. He was put to death by the Lord. No one has ever known greater rejection and loneliness. 
He took our sin. And most importantly, for those of us who trust Him, He's borne our iniquities. And we can be accounted righteous. Praise God. Let's, let's pray. It will be, we'll be done. Father, again, we just thank You so much for Christ. Father, we know that we have rebelled against You and we know that our rebellion was intentional. And we were all once God-haters. We were all once Satan worshipers. And you could have left us in our sin. And you would have been just. But you gave us this servant, your son. And Lord, you laid on him our iniquities. And you put him to death. And we thank you so much. And Lord, you didn't leave him in the grave, but you raised him from the dead so that we too, though we die, we will be raised. Thank you for this good news. Thank you for what you've done. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.